Good morning. I'd like to start straight away because we've got plenty of slides about timber today. This should be very helpful for your flip sections. Um, could you hear me properly? Is that enough? A bit higher? Is that fine? Good. So what we'll cover today is based on a few sources we find online, but again there are a couple of books. Uh, the first is the Timber Construction Manual, not the most exhaustive, but at least you can find it on the library. It's available also as an electronic resource. And the second one is not specifically on timber, but I would highly recommend it for any subject in construction, Fundamentals of Building Construction by Edward Allen. Uh, some of the things are taken from these two books and others are taken from website and manufacturers, data sheets and these type of things. But what we'll cover today is mainly uh, wood and timber, so what are the material properties and again manufacturing, defects, treatment, uh, fairly basic things, different species, products, uh, and then we'll talk about the composite products, so plywood, uh, particle board, laminated timber. Uh, then we'll go into something that I think you've probably seen in tutorials because you're doing the flipbook section assignment. So you've probably seen already what the platform frame is and what the construction steps are. So you should already be familiar with that, but we'll look a little bit more in detail at connections and I'll show you some also axonometric use of details so that you have a database of things you can probably use for the third part of the assignment uh, in a couple of weeks. Uh, there are a couple of complementary products. Uh, so there is this plasterboard and fiber cement which are used for indoor cladding and outdoor cladding. So somehow they are related to the use of light frame and we'll talk about these today. And uh, after a break that I don't know exactly when it's going to happen because I've got probably more than 100 slides for the first part. Uh, I'll try to flip them fast. Uh, I want to talk about reciprocal structures that are not exactly related to uh, what you're doing in assignment, but it's an, an interesting way of using short beams of timber to cover very large spans. So they have been used somewhere in architecture, mainly for pavilions or uh, exhibitions or temporary stuff, but uh, they're rather interesting and I want to talk about that. So let's start straight away with the material properties, wood and timber. So timber comes from wood, of course. And what is the idea is that we convert tree trunks into more regular elements. So that's the overall definition. You just need to bear in mind that there are two parts. You see here the hardwood. So this is the part which is suitable to be converted into timber for construction and the subwood. This is not good. It's not good because it's too fresh. The, the cells are still active, alive, and there is a lot of moisture, so it would be very difficult to convert these into proper timber for construction. So that's uh, what happens when you get the, ma the natural material before conversion. And uh, you see here the way uh, timber grows. So there are some hollow cells, and this means that uh, is the reason why it's a lightweight material. And also, it's a strong material because by nature it has to withstand to wind forces and to the self-weight. So somehow it's a strong material that grows in concentric circles. I think you probably know that. It's something that we all do even uh, in high school or middle school before that. But in some ways it also means that the material is strong but also heterogeneous. So it's not not like concrete or masonry. There are some differences we'll talk about later. Um, what about Australia? If you look at, there are two way, different ways of getting timber. So there are some natural uh, native forests and there are some by plantation. So for instance, pine is imported. There is not native pine here. It's imported and they are specifically planted for construction, for harvesting and construction. But no more than 10% of the native forest can actually be used for harvesting. So we also import a lot of timber from overseas. 
So that's the, if you look at this uh, Good Council of Victoria, so that's the resource where you can find this type of data. And we need to divide straight away to different families, softwood and hardwood. You've probably seen or you've probably heard about these two words. Uh, I'll tell you straight away, the softwoods are mainly used for structural purposes. So let's say pine, radiata pine. Hardwood is mainly for flooring and cladding. It's generally denser, uh, stronger from that point of view. So th this is more or less the, the, the thing you need to know. So that generally softwood is used for structural purposes. In some cases, hardwood for lintels. Um, so generally we all, what we also say is that one is denser than the other. There are some exceptions. For instance, balsa is an exception in terms of hardwood. But I'll let you look at the slides with more, uh, in more detail later. Um, the, the way timber is actually produced required a lot of years. We're talking about decades in most of the cases, from 30 to 50 years. So it really depends uh, on the species and on the speed of growth. But for instance, from phase one, growth and regeneration, to the assessment and harvesting, there could be a couple of decades, probably three to five. Then there is trimming, transport, and milling. And that's where the technology starts. And all this is, you've probably heard also in other subjects, that is kind of sustainable cycle because from the forest we trim and harvest and then milling we produce these slide frame houses and when we want to recycle them we either send them back to uh, recycle directly the pieces of timber or we can just burn them and recover the energy. Of course we produce CO2 but this one is going to be bred by trees which produce oxygen and so forth. So the cycle is kind of sustainable with the right proportions, of course. But the technology happens after this trimming and milling phase. And there are two ways to actually cut a, a timber, timber, timber trunk. It's more or less like, you know, when you are cooking and you've got vegetables in front of you, you never know what's the best way to cut the cheese. Uh, or to cut other type of vegetable. There, there are manuals on that, actually. Uh, there are also rules about the timber. The main possibilities are two. And one is used for structural purposes, and the other one is used for flooring and cladding. Because there are aesthetic reasons, <coughs> so that you really want to cut, for instance, this quarter zone cuts perpendicularly to the, to the grain. So there is also an aesthetic reason behind that. And with the back zone, you, you cut through the grains in order to get the, la the largest boards you can and in order to get the maximum amount of material and reduce the waste. But by doing that, uh, the static qualities are, I mean, somehow reduced. So that's the type of cut that is very suitable for radiata pine, uh, pine in general, so for structural purposes. So you see here what happens. Imagine you have this plank. Uh, and you get this plank from different parts of the tree log. So you see immediately the differences in terms of grain and also in terms of um, structural properties. So this is what happens with the back zone. It's pretty straightforward. So you, you've got the tree log. You get all the boards in parallel on the left and right, and you try to get the most of the material and reduce the waste. So let's say pine, Oregon, they generally cut this way, and this is the type of grain you get. So when you look at uh, a piece of pine, that, that's generally what you see in the cross section. What happens with the quarter zone, which is suitable for cladding and flooring? Again, this is the type of grain, you saw these fibers are running perpendicularly. So you just, you, it's like drawing a cross on the tree log and then cut it, cutting always by 45 degrees. So this is more homogeneous and consistent, and you always get this type of cross-section. So that's what you see. This is common for hardwood. Having done that, you remember that I just mentioned that there are some uh, hollow cells 
in the, in the, in the tree log. So this means that the timber is also full of water, moisture. We can't use it as a fresh material. So we need to uh, pass through this phase which is called seasoning. So we need to make sure that the timber is actually dry and ready for construction. They, they used to, they, in the past, they used to use it for construction also as a fresh material, but with some shrinkage problems after it was already placed in position. We want to avoid that. So there are two main possibilities. Again, the first one, air drying, used in the past, because, again, it's a matter of years of uh, seasoning, and the kiln dry, most recent one. What about the air seasoning? seasoning? You, you get the boards, you know, the boards that you've just cut before, for instance, with the back zone. You stack them here, so you see they're stacked, and you just let them dry. Uh, there is a rule of thumb. Every time you get a board of 25 mil thickness, the seasoning requires about one year. So can you imagine the type of, the amount of time you need to do that? Much faster when you want to, when you want to do that by kiln seasoning. So in this case, we are reducing the, uh, the seasoning phase to a matter of days, a few days. We could also say that they're again stuck in bolts and then there is, uh, they are heated. So somehow drying is more homogeneous and you can also kill most insect pests due to that. So there are some advantages in doing that. It's an industrialized pr procedure. So it's very difficult that you find air seasoning nowadays unless you really have time to wait for that. But shrinkage. So this is an issue that happens. When you get rid of the water, if there are some hollow cells, of course, the material tends to shrink. So to reduce in size, you know, that's shrinkage. Um, what happens? After that, there are definitely defects. But somehow, it's still better that this happens during the seasoning phase rather than during construction. Because can you imagine you start placing studs, joists, and then after six months, one year, suddenly they shrink, they reduce in size, and your, your house starts to you know, become, you know, when you get these uh, squeaky floors in the past, that's because the, 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 the plants were placed uh, while, while fresh, so that they season over the years, and then they shrink. So it's important that we get through this process before constructing. So when we get a piece 45 by 90, that's actually the size we, we have. So there, there won't be any further process. Concrete instead, we spoke about that last week, would continue to shrink over its life uh, span. Of course, there are different ways uh, in which the material can shrink. But I, I let you look at that later. It's not really important for us. Just bear in mind that the material shrinks and this might create some defects you need to consider prior to construction. There are also other irregularities and defects which are natural, so we can't avoid that. For instance, if you look at these knots or this spiral grain, that's something that relates to the, to the tree log. So it, we, can't, you know, we can't really do anything on that. We're just to deal with that. And this is the way they look like. So generally, these knots or these bark pockets, they tend to, there, there can also be some artificial defects, but in most of the cases, they tend to weaken the, the timber. So structurally speaking, they are very weak spots, and we, we really want to get rid of them as much as possible, especially during bending. They are, they are, they are spots which don't behave in the way we expect them to. There are also other organic hazards we need to care about. So look at, for instance, the H2, termites, animals. So this is something that we need to consider because, of course, timber is uh, irregular and has some problems due to its nature, but also animals and weather in general are the two things we need to care about. So we always need to protect our houses, your case studies, from animals and weather, always. So bear this in mind, anytime you place an end cap, a waterproofing layer, generally it's to protect either from rain or from
from a termite. Also other animals, sometimes also from humans. So timber treatment, uh, wh what do we do in order to contrast termites? First of all, we place an end cap. Look at these stamps. You see these end caps, this metal plate? This is just to discourage these animals to climb to the bearers. And then you see these like C and bearers and then these red joists. The color identifies a specific treatment which has been applied to the surface a chemical treatment that protects the timber. It's generally colored so that you know exactly what happens. So you already know that the timber has been treated. So that's the reason of the color, all right? So you see here, I'm just listing the type of um, treatments you can do. In, not in every case the color actually uh, means that it is the intrinsic color of the substance. You just add a color to make sure that someone realizes that the timber has been treated. So it's just a marker, all right? If we now look at the species and products, uh, we know that there are also different colors in nature according to the type of timber. But uh, one important thing to consider is that if you look at the color from the catalog like this one, you need to remember that true aging they will all tend to become gray. So that's the tendency. Timber tends to become gray. So after a few years, if this is used as a cladding of a house, it will change color. Right? That's the color of the structural timbers. So that's what you'll find in the frames of your case study houses. So this radiata pine, this Oregon. Sometimes you find in lintels, you see that there is a hardwood. So this is the type of color and grain you see. Just a, you know, just a, an overview of the catalogs, and this is where you find them. So this type of radiata pine is generally here for this frame studs and top plates. The Oregon is generally used for the joists, so you find it here. This one is a piece of Oregon, and uh, this is hardwood. These joists and barrels are done out of hardwood. So you see also the difference between the catalog, just the, what you see on the catalog and what you see in reality on your case studies. In terms of sizes, there are, of course there are tables, but there are some patterns. So it's very important that you remember 45 by 90, or 45 by 140, 45 by 240 in terms of height or stat. But uh, <coughs> uh, what happens, uh, to these numbers. They are metric numbers, but if you look at this, they're not regular, like 100, 150, 200. Why that? Because most of the times the timber is cut to size, let's say to 150, and then it shrinks and it becomes 140. So that's one of the reasons why you find these weird measures. All right? But remember these patterns which are highlighted in blue because they are the most common measures you'll find in your case studies. And already said before, but the technical term for the structural properties of timber is that it's an autotropic material. So if you consider the three axes, longitudinal, tangential, and radial, so they are the different ways in which I'm placing the grain to resist to external forces. So timber behaves differently according to the way it's placed. So you see here, rotation by 90 degrees, 45, so radially, and zero. The way we want to place it is always longitudinal, so following the direction of the grain in order to get the best of, of its bending properties, never on the other side. Otherwise, you could get uh, much weaker behavior. It's also interesting, just out of curiosity, this table. This table identifies an important property, the density. Density is measured in kilograms out of, divided by cubic meters. So how much this timber weighs. And you see that there is a, lo a lot of variety. If you look at the radiata pine, for instance, it's 550 kilograms by cubic meters, and if you look at these other ones at the top, they are more than double, so 1,100 kilograms. 
uh, divided by cubic meters. So it's a, there is a huge variety in terms of density. So density identifies how much they weigh. All right? Bear in mind this first property. The second and third properties, which is generally bending and compressive strength, are graded through two different procedures. The first one could be visual grading, so that there is an expert person which actually look at the piece, at the sample of timber, and identifies the, the qualities and the strengths. And the other one is machine made. So there is a machine which is actually bending a piece of timber, calculate the modulus of elasticity, and from that also there is another compression test so that you calculate the strength to compression. You see here in this picture there is a this is a very simple machine, not the one that it's used for grading, but it's downstairs at the Fab Lab. You have probably seen it in constructing environments. So you place two pieces of timber, uh, one piece of timber, sorry, at a distance of one meter, so two supports, so the span is always one meter. You uh, bend it with a point force in the middle. You calculate the displacement. From that displacement, you calculate the modulus of elasticity. Compressive test means you take a sample and you just push it, squeeze it until it cracks. And again, you calculate how much weight, load, you need to apply in order to do that. And having done that, you grade the timber. So for the visual grading, there are these codes identified by the letter F, where F stands for force. And in some cases, they're also color graded. But what we care about is these uh, machine-graded pines, so MGP. This is more reliable because it's done through machines. So in this case, you get the modulus of elasticity, megapascal, so that's the unit of expression, and also the bending value. And somewhere, somehow you can make correspondences between this machine grading and the visual grading. So there are, not, it's not exactly, but it's kind of equivalent. So you can say that an FGP-15 generally behaves better or at least as a F-11, all right? So anytime you know the type of forces you have to withstand, and you can immediately choose the type of timber that is suitable for your needs. So it's, I think it's pretty straightforward, the, 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 the idea. So generally what you, what you find in the data sheets are already these type of values. You don't need to bother yourself doing that. That's provided by the manufacturers. It's very rare you need to do that yourself. There are also some composite materials you'll find in your, in your case studies, and they're very helpful. And for instance, particle board, plywood is the most famous, most common, uh, LVL, laminated veneer lumber. So let's have a look at plywood, for instance. You already see what type of application for that. So it's used in sheets. And the overall idea of plywood is that you've got, let's say, minimum two or more plies that you just bond together with glue. And generally what you do, you have the, the grain of the timber running in one direction. For the second sheet, the second layer, they're running in the orthogonal direction so that you make it stronger. And they behave, let's say, in a similar way in both directions. So that's the principle of plywood, to combine several layers together and bond them together. Uh, why you, do you do that? Well, you would do that because in this case you can cover large areas with very thin sheets. And that's what we want to do generally, for instance, when we got a, um, um, a stud, stud wall frame and we want to, to cover it, we want to brace it. So we use these type of sheets. Uh, there is a grading uh, system also for plywood and it's generally <coughs> related to the way uh, the glue is actually performing because in this case the glue makes most of the job. So the type A is stronger and then B less and C and so forth. Particle board, also called chipboard, um, Let's say it's another type of material you'll find in your case studies. What you'll see is this one here, the yellow one, 19 mil uh, thickness. 
So what happens in this case, you have got particles and a special resin that bonds them together. So the same principle, but uh, let's say less, uh, less sophisticated material. Um, how do these things like plywood or uh, laminated vinyl, uh, lumber, uh, or even solid timber, you can make engineers, uh, engineered elements such as this I beam. This looks like a steel beam, but it's made out of the, the web, for instance, in this case, is made out of ply. And uh, you see the, the, the flanges can be made out of uh, solid timber or LVL. And in this case, look at the depth, up to 400 mil. So it's something like that very thick beams so that you can cover large spans. So this type of engineered materials can actually be used to, uh, let's say, cover more, uh, cover large spans and uh, perform better than the, than the natural pieces of timbers you find on the market. Here you see an example. So you see the ply here and the solid timber or LVL for the top and bottom flanges. You see the way they are connected. Somehow there is also the possibility for prefabrication in combination of steel and timber. So in some cases the larger spans are actually uh, covered by steel elements. So you see these profiles here. And then the intermediate joists are done with these engineered elements. So that there is a combination of steel and timber and they are connected with these galvanized plates. Another interesting material, which is becoming, this is mainly out of curiosity, I don't think you use it, but uh, cross-laminated timber. This is the hope for a uh, timber building done entirely out of timber, multi-story building. It's a kind of, look at this picture on the right. You should think about it as a kind of very thick and strong plywood. All right? So they have already realized multi-story buildings out of this material so that you don't need any steel or other concrete elements to do the job of the main structural skeleton. So it's, it, it, this is useful for anything, for, from cladding to, to structural purposes. But let's talk about the timber frame. Um, in the past, the solid pieces of timber were combined together in this way. So there were slots, uh, very complicated slots and uh, notches, so they were interlocked together um, in such a way that required a very laborious and laborious work done by expert people. Try to imagine to prepare all these slots to combine together these beams, columns, you know, they, they all meet at the same point. So everything is done out of timber. Very complicated stuff. Look at this, for instance. The, the one on the left is, a, is, is another one of that kind. So you see that there is this column, this star coming here, and there is a very complicated slot and a hole, and then another notch, a slot in the, in the beam, in the joist coming through, and then there is a timber nail that connects them together. Very difficult to prepare that. It requires a few machines and expertise. But what happens in a timber frame, it's a bit different. It's called lap joint. So it means that you take one element, you place another element beside, and then through a nail, you connect them together. So the invention of the nail is kind of revolution in order to make sure that you can realize the structures out of lap joints rather than these very complicated interlocking elements. And it's not just the invention of the nail, which was there since the time of the Romans, but the industrial production of nails. So it's about, not this one you see on the left, this bronze sheep nail coming from the period of the Romans that it would take probably, you know, one day to prepare 10 of them, but when we can actually produce many nails so that we can apply them everywhere. Every time we need a joint, you just place two elements beside nails and that is fixed. So that's the real revolution. 
Uh, there is a short video here that you see actually how these type of things work. And the, the simplicity compared to the way it used to be done through interlocking elements. So it's rather fast. Right? You see, the rule is always the same. You never interlock elements. You place them beside much faster. And also less uh, labor, less expertise. OK, maybe I, I have exaggerated with the slides on nails, but if, at least you've got a fairly good representation of the products available. Um, now about the frame itself. So that we have discovered that there is a simple way to create light frames. So we place the elements beside and we use nails. So the first system to, to, to construct, to build houses, let's say two-story houses or three-story houses out of timber, light frame, was the balloon frame, called balloon just to express the lightness, the lightweight of this type of structure. So what happened here was that there were these uh, mullions running through uh, the walls, like for two stories. So f you see from the ground slab until the roof rafter. And then the, the joists were added at a later stage. So these mullions run for two stories. And now there is a more efficient way to do so, which is the platform frame, the one that you have in your case studies and that is commonly used in Australia. Why that? It's because you have these uh, stud walls, which are concluded in themselves. <coughs> and on the top of that, you can place the joist. After the joist, you can actually walk on the floor and repeat the same operation for the first floor. So the idea of the accessibility uh, simplifies the construction side. So that's the overall idea. So the platform frame is a kind of evolution uh, and make it, makes it much simpler, the whole construction process. Uh, in terms of connection, of course, there are nails, but there are also other types of connections we look at. Uh, which are, for instance, uh, screws, bolts for very heavy loads, or there are also galvanized placed with predetermined spots where you can actually place your nail. So these are all meant to help uh, and simplify the way we do connections. So steel is an important resource for light web frame construction. So look at these plates. What happens here is that they're already shaped in a specific way so that we connect, for instance, studs with other horizontal elements. And then there are, you see these pre-drilled uh, specific spots so that we know exactly where we need to place the nail. So there is nothing to think about. You just place it exactly where it has to be so the structure is more efficient and the two elements are exactly interlocked in a fixed joint, all right? Screws are generally they can resist a higher load, but they also have another advantage. Now I'm providing a few different possibilities like full threaded, half threaded, X head, Phillips head. Uh, but the real point of that is that if you want to just uh, prepare your structure, you want to undo everything, you can actually just take it out. Uh, with the nails, that would be a little bit more problematic. But for very heavy loads, the bolt is the only possible suitable solution. So in this case, again, you've got several possibilities in terms of thread and diameter. They're generally graded. Uh, you find them both in the imperial and metric system. Uh, I mean, I, I don't know why exactly, but you still find them in both. Uh, I'm more familiar with the metric system, but again, there are some specific loads they can carry, and you dimension the, the, the bolts according to that. Now, let's have a look at the platform framing in Australia. So what happens, a little bit of terminology, and then I'll go through a set of photographs. So something that you have probably done in the tutorials already for your case study. But just to make sure that we know all the terminology, uh, if you look at the Australian standards, 1, 6, 8, 4, I think 0. 0.4, uh, you find the images I have placed in the following 10, 15 slides. 
So here is all the terminology. We start from the bottom. So we see this stamp. Uh, most of the times they can also be done out of concrete. Then you see the hand cap, bearers, <coughs> joists running orthogonally so that you make a grid. Then go to, well, let's go to the wall. So we see the bottom plate running here, the stud, when we create an opening, we've got a jam stud, jack stud, the seal, all right? So the trimmer that trims the, the studs and to restore the continuity in terms of structure, you make this seal trimmer. On the top, it's the same thing, but it's called lintel. So this element here is called lintel. Then there is a top plate and then we need to brace that, so there is this diagonal element. And then these small horizontal elements are called noggins. What they do, the, the vertical studs are very slender, so the height is very, uh, is very high compared to the, to, the, to the cross section. So they tend to buckle when they are subject to a vertical load. So they tend to buckle like that. It depends on the type of joints, but they, they tend to buckle. So these noggins, what they do, they reduce the height of, of these studs and avoid buckling. So that's the, that's the trick. Uh, rafters are actually the joists for the roof. So joist and rafter is more or less the same thing. So this is the type of basic terminology you need to be familiar with. And now let's start from the bottom. So you see these concrete posts? The stamps, thermite caps, and then bearers, joists. And uh, what you see is that I think it's very clearly visible here, the thermite cap. What I'm showing you are some freehand uh, drawings of details. You know, you might want to add to your flipbus section. So sometimes if you want to express or explain this type of problem related to the thermites, and at the same time you want to explain how two uh, joists or bearers can be connected together through a scarf joint, you can draw this simple detail. You know, axonometric view, freehand. That's a very good complement for a flipbook section to explain that type of detail. Uh, the second one is also very interesting because you've got an existing masonry wall, and what you'll do, you place at the, an end cap. Um, at the beginning and then you just place the last edge bearer which allow you to connect it to the other grid members. So again, this is another nice detail you want to make a close-up of, for, for instance, for the flip sections. If we now look about the wall, again, we've already seen that top, bottom plate, top plate, lintel. Uh, in, the, in the case we want to fix um, a door or a window, uh, at the lower height we have got this uh, dropper. And then here again jack studs, jam studs, so we double the, the stud when there is a window because can you imagine that there the were supposed to be three studs in this position, so we need to replace that cross section we got rid of. We need to replace it on the two sides. Again, the way the, the timber frame is connected to the ground slab. So these studs are actually fastened to the bottom plate and then the bottom plate is connected through a dynabolt to the ground slab. So you just, there are rules on how to do that and how often you need to do that. So you just drive the dynabolts into the ground floor slab so that they are fixed together. The top plates are taking the loads from the upper floor and then they are transmitting this load to the studs and then we need to brace it. So we have got this diagonal strap, uh, strap so there can also be timber elements to, to brace the, the frame. You, all, you know that always quadrilateral shapes are never um, stable. They always need to be triangulated in order to be structurally stable. Here you see another detail of the openings. You see, what I'm doing, I'm taking images from construction sites and I'm comparing them to the drawings I find in Australian standards so that you see the two things together. Um, look at this lintel again. What's interesting to notice that you don't see in the drawing, the material has actually changed. So this is a piece of hardwood. So in order to do that job, 
you don't use pine, but you use hardwood in order to have a stronger material for this bead. And this is again another dropper just to make sure that if you want to fix a window, you have the right height to do so. Bottom plates and noggings, you see the noggings here, which are nailed from the side. And bracing. Bracing can happen through these metal straps, timber elements, uh, sheet bracing, so you can use plywood to, to, to perform that job. Uh, what you can also, you also need to remember that these temporary props are needed uh, until you have placed uh, the, the, the stud walls in both directions, at least in two directions. So if you look at this image, you see you've got elements running in one direction and then in the perpendicular one. And somehow they all need to be connected together in order to make the structure, the structure stable laterally. Um, so before this happens, you have temporary props to support the, the stud walls in the meanwhile. Some critical connections. Um, I'm not really going through the details, but what I want to provide you is a database of solutions that you can use for your free boost section when you want to you know, just go a little bit more in depth of a specific detail. And what I find interesting is, for instance, how to turn corners. In some of your case studies, it might be interesting to show that. In other cases, you've got these T-junctions because you have a wall and then you've got another internal partitions. And how do you connect them together? So this is another critical connection you might want to look at for your flip push section. And uh, sometimes you find these straps and you wonder what they are. Of course, nails are fine to connect elements together, but in some cases you need a stronger connection in order to avoid that elements are pulled apart. And also in order to avoid that, you know, this is light, so generally due to wind and other forces, the elements tend to be pulled apart. So you really want to use these, uh, uh, these straps to fix the elements in a stronger way. So here you see, again, an image of the construction site, which for instance you can place on your flipbook section assignment, and also other drawings that explain exactly what that element performs. And then it can be complemented with a short annotation, a short caption. Okay, now we are at the upper floor framing. Uh, of course, we, we've got stairs or we've got skylights, so somehow we have the joists running from one side to the other, but we also need to create some openings for the stairs and skylights eventually. So we use these trimmers. So it's more or less the same thing you would do when you open a window, but horizontally. So it's always a matter to break the structural continuity given by the joists and restore it using a trimmer. In the case your opening runs in parallel with the joist, then you don't need to do that. So this is just when the joist runs perpendicularly. But what happens in the walls, you see, is more or less the same of what happens at the ground floor. So you, you are just repeating the same operations. Bottom plate, top plate, studs, nuggings, bracing, openings, a piece of hardwood for the linter, always the same thing. So the two different stories are actually done in the same way. And look at these connections again. Galvanized plates to accommodate the joists, and there are these pre-drilled uh, holes for, to, to, to place the nails in a specific spot. Uh, what's different in this image? There are posi struts, so also the joists are not made of solid material, but of a lightweight material. So wh what are they? Maybe I'll show you a close-up. Yeah, that's visible. So you see there are these uh, solid pieces of timber on the, on the top cord and bottom cord. And then there is these wavy steel elements, so they are plates that you nail to the other pieces of timber, and what they do, they generate a truss system. 
So this thrust system allows you to go in high, to increase the height of the beam, and therefore to span a longer distance. But at the same time, it's lightweight, so you're saving material. So you don't need the full section, because you're actually using a set of bars. So structurally speaking, this thrust performs as a set of bars, which are these, connected through hinges. In this case, they are fixed nodes, but theoretically speaking, the idea of a truss is to have bars which perform through axial stress, so just compression and tension, and they transfer the load in that way. So sometimes they're done in steel. Most of the times they're done in steel, and there are spherical joints. Roof framing. In roof framing, what happens is it's more or less an inclined uh, an inclined uh, floor. But we haven't got joists, we call them rafters here. And the connection also are kind of similar. There are these struts, but uh, depending on the type of forces you need to react to, you need to withstand, there are different types of connections that again are stronger or weaker. So here you see a few possibilities, photographs, but also when there are very heavy loads, most of the times you will find bolts. So the, you will see these bolted connections. So when you find this type of connection here, it means that the loads coming from the floor which are transferred are generally heavier than in the other cases. So you can like type of guess the type of loads you need to withstand also from the type of connections between elements. The connections are always more important than the elements themselves to understand the loads you need to withstand. So that's a nice way to guess things because not all the time you, you know exactly the way it was designed. So you need to guess it. Uh, the, same, the same principle applies also to the post anchor connection. So this is again a light, lightweight construction and wind can actually, uh, we, I mean we don't want this structure to take off. So we need to make sure that it's actually anchored properly to the ground and what happens, for instance, in high wind zones, look at number five, you see you've got this C-shaped element which is embedded in the concrete pad, so in the footing, and this is definitely a stronger connection than number one or number two. So again, you guess from the connection, you guess exactly the type of forces uh, to which the structure was designed to, to withstand. Now, I need to look, to go very fast through this type of materials because it's almost 12. But just quickly about plasterboard and fiber cement, and then we'll have a, a short break. So what happens is that now we've got the skeleton. Uh, that is not enough. We need, to, we need to go a little bit further. So we need to clad it. And we've got indoor applications and outdoor applications. So plasterboard in interior, uh, fiber cement exterior, easy. So I, I, I placed as they are a couple of uh, definitions from the standard because uh, plasterboard of course is a, is a cast gypsum plaster but what happens is that it's also graded according to a few things. There is a bracing grade because we can use it instead of steel or timber to brace a timber wall. So it's graded according to that. But it's also grading according to fire. So remember that we need to make sure our building can uh, resist fire for a limited amount of time, 30, 60, 90 minutes. So they are graded according to that. And in terms of dimensions, there are some standards. And what you'll find in your case studies is generally, look at the first line here, 10 mil. That's what you will find in 100% of the domestic applications. All right? Uh, what's, what's the way you apply that? If you look at the source, you will find so many diagrams and instructions on how to do that. But it's pretty much self-explanatory. So you've got the daisies that you use to locate the, the position of the studs. 
And then after that, you can just place your sheets, which come in uh, specific dimensions. So you make sure that you've got a wall which is 2,700 mil. You make sure you divide it in two sheets so that you don't have cutoffs here and there. So you make sure you, you consider that during design. And then you can use nails or screws to fix it to the start. There is also another possibility to do it without adhesives but it's more or less the same thing. So please use these drawings and these schemes to help uh, yourself in the development of the assignments, okay? Especially for the last phases before, before the submission. So it will be probably next and in two weeks. What about the uh, connections? Again, they are somehow the most important part. So how to fix it is rather easy. How to make connections, for instance, in corners becomes a little bit more complicated. So we need the support of some extra elements. In this case, again, we are going to use steel. So you see the connection is done in a way that we've got these L elements. So you never cut the panels by 45 degrees. There is always one coming as a guide for the second one. And then you use these corner bits, one for the outer edge, and there is also the negative version for the for this one. So you see this one is used outside and this one is used inside. What happens when you've got a connection between a uh, plasterboard and a door jamb? Again, there are two possibilities. First, you can use this element here that fix it close to the door jamb, or you can also use a P50 or P60. In this case, you want to express that there are two elements placed beside and therefore, you see, you've got the shadow line. So it's in this case, you see, listen, there are two different elements. I'm changing the system, so I want to show it. You express the shadow line, and you can use this P50 or P60 bit to do that. All right? Not going to through this detail right now, but just showing you here and there some possibilities. And then it's up to you to, to continue on this research job. Okay, let's, let's pretend the walls are finished. The floor is another matter. Now we, we have to look at the ceiling. So that's the last part. Otherwise, we, we've got joists and we've got services everywhere. We want to close it up. So we want to have a nice and clean uh, ceiling. So what happens? We uh, drop down a grid of um, this uh, a nice grid of fur in channels, and uh, they're hanged to the joists, and to this fur in channels, then we fix the plasterboard sheets. So that is what happens generally. Um, why we do that? Because in this case, we've got room for services, which can be from you know electrical services to air conditioning and other things. That's free space. So in most of the cases, we also want to control the height of the building after the main structure is done. So we can use this uh, you know, ceiling system to control that height and reach a specific height. Um, here again, you see that there is a, a grid of perpendicular furring channels connected to the joists. And it doesn't really matter what's the material you use for the structure. So it could be steel, the first one on the left, timber, concrete. There is always the same hanger, which is actually fixed, and then there is a clip even for a bondex system to, to, to fix these hangers to the structural <coughs> elements. In some other cases, you will find that you don't really have much room for services, so probably they will run through the joists, so you will use that space for, for the services. And what happens is that, that the clips to fix the furring channels are actually connected straight to the joist. So that's what happens. You've got the clips straight there, and then the channels ready for the, for the plasterboard. Well, in some other cases, you need to, I don't know, maybe for renovations even, or for bathrooms or kitchens, Sometimes you want to, again, you need extra room for services, let's say air conditioning or these type of things. So you want to have these bulkheads. 
so your scene is already done, your structure is there, you need to create these weird uh, shapes that change definitely the feeling of your, of your room, but you might do that. You'll find a lot of these in uh, hotels, a little bit less in domestic applications, many in bathrooms or kitchens, but I'm not going in detail because it's always the same technology, but again, you go to the manufacturer websites and you see exactly the system they use, you find the details, and in some cases, if you are lucky, you even find the CAD drawings, okay, ready to use for your applications. Now, let's have a look at the exterior part of it, then we'll have a break. So, compressed fiber cement cladding. Um, that's how it looks like. I'm not going into architectural considerations, I'm just concerned about what that is. But what happens to this material is that this is a kind of, let's say it's a plasterboard resistant for exterior applications. And again, it's fastened to a specific substructure. So let's have a look at this detail. Here you see, so the interior is up here, and there is a frame or a structure or whatever. So you have got these T-head clips, T-head because they look like a hat, and you fix your panels, you fasten your panels through these hats. And then look at this plate, this small plate here is used for waterproofing, so to avoid that water goes through the panels. So in lecture 11, there will be Giorgio Marfella's I guess, still talk specifically about waterproofing. But bear this in mind, when you, when, you, when you wonder what the function of this element is, that's for waterproofing, because that's the weak point that you need to protect. So again, what I like to do is generally to have a drawing. Imagine you've got the, your flipbook section. Then you've got a detail like that. I'm already thinking about assignment three. Then you've got this T hat here with all the specific properties and things you need to list and explain. And then you've got an image of the final result. So that's the best way to explain things. All right? So that's the panel, so flat surface. And then what are the other two critical elements? Corners, positive and negative corners. So here you see another detail of the positive corners. Steel, steel beams coming here and making this 90 degrees angle. Then you've got the T hats, but there is an another L-shaped plate for the corner. So you see the shadow line here. And when you have the negative, so the other, the other way around, so you see again there is a shadow line in this L-shaped element. So these are the type of things you want to highlight in your flipbook sections. Always uh, the traditional conventional system on the surface, the connections, waterproofing, and then the corners. They're generally the most interesting elements. So connection between vertical and horizontal, connection between two materials, protection from weather or animals, right? So these are the type of things you want to look at and you want to explain through details, drawings, and images. Any questions so far? No? Is it somehow helpful for your flipbook session assignment? Makes it sense? All right. So you want to have a, you have a question? Or you want to have a break? Break. 10 minutes. So we'll meet at 15 past 12. Good. So the second part is, I will mainly talk about reciprocal structure, but just give you a few slides about the idea of using solid timber that becomes the use of a light frame construction like we're used to see nowadays. So that's what I found when I was living in Denmark. It, this is a Viking area. It's a, of course, it's a reconstruction. Nothing survived out of timber of that period. So this is a reconstruction of a, 
of a, of a, of a building that is inspired from the shape of ships. So you see that it's actually uh, that type of shape. Uh, the pronunciation of this area is Furkart. And what happens here is that you see timber is used in its natural form, like of tree trunks, for the structural parts, cladding, you see the props here as well. So everything is used in that form. And the joints, I apologize, I don't have a better picture, but uh, uh, are actually these scarf joints with this section, and there are timber nails. So everything is done out of timber, fairly complicated. Uh, there are also other T-junctions and connections which are fairly complicated, but the idea of the light frame doesn't exist in that period at all. And also when we arrive to the modern movement in the 20th century, the first buildings by Frank Lloyd Wright, so that, you know, in Chicago there is a small neighborhood in the west area, Oak Park. It used to be a very nice neighborhood, now a bit less. Uh, you find plenty of these houses. The first one he did, uh, the first ones he did, have a light frame construction, but the final, uh, you know, the final expression of the building is given as a kind of render, so you really want to show that this is a solid, heavy base, and then it becomes lighter after. So you want to hide, you try to make sure that you fake the presence of masonry concrete. So you don't really want to show that. But it's, I think that if everything starts more or less, uh, if I'm not wrong, with the Schindler House in California. So if you go to LA in the 20s already, you find this construction. This is a kind of revolution because you use the light frame and what Rudolf Schindler did was to express it as it is, as a lightweight material. So you see the frame and all what is structure is there and the other parts are actually made out of windows. More, most of that is windows. So you see the light frame, we're not shy. We don't want to hide it because this is a light wave doesn't mean poor and weak construction. It means modernity. It means the future. And in the 40s and the 50s, there was a California magazine which encouraged architects to build these type of houses. It was called the Case Study House Program. They've done, as far as I know, they've done 23 houses. Some of them are visitable, some others are, are not because they're private houses, very expensive ones. If you look at this image, uh, the Case Study House 22 is one of the most famous because it has been used in uh, uh, the cinema f a few times. If you watch the movie, the film True Lies, Kevin Bacon, is done in this house. Uh, so here you see not timber, but it's steel and concrete, but the idea that everything is lightweight. So we want to show the frame, the skeleton. So it's kind of minimalist. Not, we don't really want to, 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 to fake it. And you see these are between 1950, 1974. That's the type of houses you would find in California in that period. So. Now there is no uh, concerns about using the light frame construction, which clearly express the, the structure every time, lightness, and it's always open also to the exterior. This also arrived in Australia, uh, for instance, with uh, Harry Sedler. So Harry Sedler, you see the Ross Sedler House, 1948, it's done in the same way. So this is a light frame construction. So exactly what you see in your case studies, but you see it's used in a, in a modern way. So it doesn't want to fake that this is done out of concrete. So for instance, you see the base is very light, it's suspended, everything is glazed in the front facade. So there is just a kind of, you know, it's just a kind of tube, like a very regular geometry. You see also the plan is entirely free. So partitions and columns and walls are, are also arranged according to this modernity. And again, always a little bit like what Frank Lloyd Wright also did. Large spaces, narrow spaces, large spaces, narrow spaces, alternation of that to see how to leave the house. 
the thickness of this thing if the star is 90 and then you have 10 mil of cladding so you have more or less 10 centimeters of thickness that probably wouldn't be enough in terms of thermal comfort but somehow that's the minimum you can actually reach and in that period they weren't really concerned about thermal issues so in some cases you find very very thin um, walls but what I want to talk you about it's reciprocal structures so you'll do history in another subject and reciprocal structures for two reasons the first is because um, timber and reciprocal structures have always been related so they were born because of timber and secondly because I have worked on this topic for a few years and I I was the guest editor of this journal architecture and mathematics about reciprocal structures so in this publication you find a lot of articles that I've uh, written and also together with other colleagues this is a, a, a more comprehensive book reciprocal frame architecture that it is, explains what the principle is and you'll find a lot of case studies in there uh, they're both at the library so you'll find them as electronic resources but what a reciprocal structure is it's that's a definition I wrote I'm not sure it's consistent and uh, complete but somehow it gives the idea so we talk about load bearing elements beams which supporting one another along the span never at the extremities so always along the span so you have an element never at the start and end point in the middle somewhere they compose a structure without clear hierarchy and that's it so that's the principle that's something that I did in my own kitchen so you take three knives three glasses you just place the handles on the glass openings and then you just put together these knives like to compose a fan so that's the type of structure you get you see that they support one another never at the extremities so you see the meeting point the supporting point is always along the span and there is a circularity of forces so this one is supporting this element but it's also at the same time supported by the following one so it's always supporting and supported by in a circularity of forces what happens is that the distance between this glass and the second one let's say is one one unit but this knife is long 0.7 you can actually make a floor out of it composing the structure in this way you see the relationship with timber you've always got out of natural timber you have some specific lengths you can't really get whatever you want so you use short beams to compose to to span large uh, spaces so I'm not going into details but what happens is that there is a circularity of forces in terms of shear and axial forces so they're always alternated like in negative positive negative positive so it's not about bending moment it's about shear and axial forces but <clears throat> there is something that probably makes it clearer for you you look at these two examples one in the Sindoni Chapel in Turin by Guarini so what happens is that there is a mutual structure so you take two elements and then you put a third one in the middle look at this A B C if I remove element A B's and C's will still stand in position but what happens on the right side I have A B C D if I get rid of D the structure would collapse because of that circularity of forces so there is a distinction between mutual and reciprocal so reciprocal is forced mutual mutual is kind of more volunteer all right so structurally speaking one is mutual the other one is reciprocal it'll become clearer later this is a puppet theater in Japan like in the in the Asian cultures the idea of res using reciprocal structures come from uh, small objects so we have baskets small objects that are interwoven and from that idea you scale it up and you get buildings but it could also be a religious uh, or spiritual meaning behind it so if you think about this circularity of beams which all have the same structural task purpose so they're all the same there are no hierarchies so somehow 
they create uh, this type of nice spiritual environment, the mandala principle. So these are the reasons of uh, this structure being developed in Asia, uh, especially in Japan. And uh, in, in Europe, mainly in Europe, the, the purpose was, uh, was very technical, apart from a couple of occasions, which are these two. The Palazzo Piccolomini in Pienza, where you see, the, you see this reciprocal structure here, four piece. There are four piece, which actually symbolize Papa Piccolomini, Palazzo, blah, blah, blah. So it's a decorative issue. Also because this is the smallest room of the, of the palace. So there is no purpose of doing that. And there is also another example, Casa Negra by Jujol in Spain, where there is this stairwell that has been decorated with a reciprocal structure, which is actually done out of concrete. So this is a pure decoration. And uh, why that? Because in most of the other cases, such as this one in the UK, you will never see where the reciprocal structure is because for Europeans, that's a matter of carpentry. You find it in the treatises of carpentry. So this ceiling, very nicely decorated, is actually done in this way. So you take all the cutoffs you've got and uh, you try to use all of them to make, uh, to make the joists of the floor. So you use this reciprocal arrangement of beams which you cover so you won't see it. But this one is done in this way. So the idea is that you reuse all the short beams you've got. And uh, I don't know if you have done in history of architecture the Morris House, William Morris House. Generally you see this picture. But when they have done the renovation of the building, what they've found in the floor is actually this. Look at these beams. One, two, three, four. Short beams which are arranged in a reciprocal way so that you can cover that span. Natural timber. Otherwise you will need to throw it away because you are not able to make a floor out of such short beams. So that's a very interesting thing. It was, it was very common in the treatises of carpentry, especially in France and England, uh, in the UK, in the 18th and 19th century. So you find a few of these, especially in Oxford. And it's even used nowadays, if you look at the Serpentine Pavilion, 2000 find, Alvaro Siza and Cecil Balmond, what they do, they take timber beams, and again, you see the problem is always the connection. So how would you do the connection? Would you really like to see a lot of steel in those connections? No, you won't. So what you do, you shift the beams, you create a small slot so that you interlock them in a reciprocal way. So the reciprocal structure is also a simple way to avoid the joint and to make sure that all the connections are done out of timber because it performs either by superimposition or by notches or slots. So that's another thing. Now, um, we need to look at a few configurations. So the simplest one is done of three elements. Without that, there is no circularity. But of course, you are free to add more elements to that. So for instance, in this case, we've got eight elements. So we get an octagon, and these are the type of architecture which have been realized out of this. What we can do, we can also combine together different fans. So what I, I'm going to call this unit, the simplest one, I call this a fan. And uh, when I combine a lot of fans together, I can get a, a composed structure. Like in this case, I can read these out of triangles. So there are a set of fa triangular fans, but also I can read hexagons. It's up to you. You know, once it's done, there is not really a reason to divide it in one way or the other. But several architectures have been done in this way, especially roofs. So you see, that's the way to operate on that. From a fairly simple element, you get a very complicated structure, short beams, large spans. Look at this other example here. In this example, we've got one main curvature. So we're not developing a surface like a dome, but we are developing 
It's more a bridge-like structure. I'm highlighting for you the beams, so A, B, C, D. So these four elements are composing the basic fan, which is mirrored twice, so that we get another one here and then again another mirror. So that's what happens. And there is this bridge that, I don't know, we suppose it used to be in China in the 13th century, which have just been reconstructed to see how it worked. And probably Marco Polo in his travels, he brought that knowledge to Europe back. But we have no evidence of that type of bridge, but we, we know it was there. Other possibilities are out of this square uh, fan, we can actually do floors, such as in this way. Uh, we find some sketches in Villardo Necur uh, books and also in uh, Sebastiano Serio, the seven books of architecture. Um, Sebastiano Serio, and even in John Wallace, uh, we can see that Sebastiano Serio was kind of a practical man, so you see this is buildable. But this one drawn by Villardo Necur, he wasn't really a very practical person. He was a very theoretical person. So if you try to build that, it, it won't work. Because you see these elements are 14 feet long, and they have to cover a span of 15 feet. So there are too many degrees of constraints, so you can't do that. You need to break it down in these four fans of squares. So in the way he thought about that, it's not possible to build it. So most of the times when you read old books of people doing theory, uh, you realize that they've never tried in practice to do what they write. Uh, John Wallace is the first guy, instead after, the, after Newton, so already in a scientific phase of humankind, uh, he already did calculations of this type of structure. So he knew exactly what type of forces were acting on what beam. And even Louis Kahn has used this type of thing. Look at this, this center in Philadelphia by Louis Kahn. There is a concrete, uh, an arrangement of reciprocal beams are out of, done out of concrete. Um, of course, there is not the advantage of using the short beams, but it's probably an aesthetic uh, reason behind that. But just to make a bit of morphological order, uh, they can be developed as we've seen so far as straight or flat configurations to make slabs, or curved to make domes or bridges. And they can also be one-dimensional, for instance, for de to develop bridges, or two-dimensional. So these are the type of families we have seen so far, all right? So it's interesting to notice that a flat element can actually develop a three-dimensional or two-dimensional configuration. That's rather interesting. And what are the parameters that affect that? The parameters are engagement length. So I call the distance between the end point of the beam and the support point, I call that engagement length. And this triangle here, I call it engagement window. I, I didn't decide that. It's a technical term that someone else has decided. So just take it as it is. But you see that according to this engagement length, I'm changing the elevation of this structure. So it, it actually rises from the ground. Another parameter could be the diameter of the beam, in the case it's circular. So you see that it changes the eccentricity. So the two axes of the beams uh, become more distant, and therefore the height in elevation changes. But the, the real point is that you'll never find a way to draw that elevation, because it's rather difficult. It's very easy to draw the plan view, so this is a, a model done by Leonardo da Vinci, uh, a plan composed of these uh, four element fans. But the only way to get the elevation, unless you use sophisticated tools of optimization, is uh, through uh, physical models. So you use physical models to get the elevation of these things. And the, this is visible. This is the Codex Atlanticus by Leonardo da Vinci. This is the the page 899 verso. And you see, I've identified for you a few reciprocal configurations. If you look closely, they're all drawn in plan. There is one case in which it's drawn in section, but we don't really know what that is. And uh, 
he never, he never provides an elevation or a perspective view because that's rather complicated. So you see again four uh, element planes, a different configuration than of four element planes, triangles and hexagons, uh, something unclear, and then other configurations which probably were done to develop bridges, but not really sure even if that's a reciprocal or not. But there is, a, there is an artist in the Netherlands which is working a lot on reciprocal structure. He's called Rinus Rulofs. And he has developed so many different configurations uh, because he's at the same time a mathematician and an artist. So he's actually working as an artist, but he studied mathematics at the university. And he's very proficient also in Rhino and 3D modeling. And uh, somehow we are also doing workshops together. Like every two years we meet and we organize workshops. Uh, in this case, what he brought was uh, where these pieces uh, that he's using for kids. So he's going to elementary schools to play with kids and make sure that they can make a simple dome within a few hours, you know, with these small sticks, which can be directly interlocked because they are some kind of hooks and you can develop these small domes. Again, very short elements, but very large spans. So we build these domes in a few hours. So you, how in one day you can make four or five domes and demolish them. And for kids, it's even more interesting because you see Rhinus is here, and this is probably 1.8 1, 1 height. But for kids, this is a real structure. And in my previous university, I also used to teach that at the last year to talk about spatial structures. So the overall idea was that we've seen that these type of structures develop bridges and also develop domes. But what happens if we really want to develop a three-dimensional structure, a spatial structure that doesn't have any relationship to that? Because there are more efficient ways to develop bridges and there are more efficient ways to develop domes. So why don't we try to find other configurations that can be used in architecture? So what we did, we took a very simple rule. So we get a two-dimensional pattern and from this two-dimensional pattern, we, every, every, we know that every time there is a, a rule to, let's say, break it and make it, uh, transform it into a three-dimensional pattern. So there are these geometric rules to play with. And we found out some basic configurations which can develop interesting ideas. So we played a lot with physical models. And from these physical models, then we developed some bigger structure. So the section of these is always 50 by 50s and there are screws or nails to fix them together. So fairly simple, but it was mainly an exercise to understand what to do out of that. So this is the pattern of the Leonardo Bridge, which is actually repeated in two different, in several planes and also then orthogonally, and then combined together with this kind of lap joint so that the elements never meet at the corner, but they always just sit beside. And you see here the construction and how it's done. So it's fairly simple. Also, the, you know, the students could do that in a couple of days. Uh, another simple example is this, which was called like the neural network. So what you do, you take three elements, they compose a fan. Then you take other three elements. We could say this is a, let's say, positive, and this one is negative. So one is curving up and the other one is curving down, complex and Converse, uh, and you place them one inside the other so that the second fan can actually rotate. So that's what happens. The first one and the second one. The second one is fixed because of the first one, but the first one need, needs screws, otherwise it won't work just by friction. And what happens is that you can make installations for interiors out of that because it can grow in different ways. I know it's very abstract now. It doesn't sound very related to what you're doing in the assignments, but it's still a kind of research that is there for timber constructions. So this other structure is rather interesting because look at the height. This was about five meters height. And what happens is that you get this fan made of three elements, and then, then you start uh, constructing other fans on the outer edge, all right? So that 
this is the growing, this is the, the, the growth rule. What you can do out of it is that in this case we wanted to get a very tall sculpture. So we had just three meter long uh, sticks so that we combine them together. You see here that they are overlapped and there is a little bit of design in that. But the elements don't touch. They just meet here at the nodes. There is always one centimeter of spacing. So you see here that they clearly don't touch. And you can also make a chair out of that, for instance, with bamboo. So that's what we did also in another workshop. It's fairly simple to combine these structures together. But you see that with these sticks, you wouldn't do much without this type of overlaps and superimpositions. Another system, a star. So this star is done out of an hexagon. And again, you start building further layers on the outer edge. So the basic one, you extend it. Once they're all extended, you take these two C and ones and you place a red one and you start building another hexagon running clockwise. So the first one is running counterclockwise and the second one clockwise. All right? And then you continue this way as much as you can. And that's what you get. This could be a regular one. You can also deform it. So if you have a parametric model of it, you can also deform it. And that's what you see from the bottom. They're all, this is only done by superimposition. There are no connections, no screw, no joints, just friction. And this is another system. This was called the flame. So you see I'm here. So you, you can imagine the height of this structure. Uh, and it seems to be fairly simple, but this was rather complicated. So what you do, again, you take a triangle, and then you can build other triangles from the edges, and then you continue in that way. And if you do that according to some specific angles, it could actually grow uh, infinitely, in theory. But you can also decide you want to converge so that you create these type of structures. And you can also make intermediate flaws out of it. And you see that we had a limit. Our ceiling was actually five meters. It was in an industrial area. So we had to close it, reach a certain height. But you probably see that the first structure the students did was not exactly like the final one. So you see that when you just use rope to make the joints so that there is no transfer of bending moment, this structure doesn't stand at all. So it seems to be fairly simple to get that, but it's actually very complicated. If you don't manage the geometry properly so that the forces are transferred in the right way, this is what you get. All right, and it's rather wrong. Uh, other examples, so you see what is it's interesting here is that you start with a square on the right side and you have got triangles on the left side and the, the two elements are combined here with this butterfly orthogonally. So the square are running on this plane and the triangles are running on the other plane. So it's starting to become more complex uh, that's the generating rule. I've got a bit faster now. Uh, in this case, I would say that the model is more interesting than the real one. We didn't have proper scaffolds and methods to actually make it look like a roof. But crown, so this is a crown made of triangles and squares. Then you just break it and you develop it as a spiral. That's another possibility. So we have explored a few possibilities. And of course, this has also been used for furniture, because for furniture you get very nice joints and details. Look at this book, Werner Blaser. Uh, I think the title of the book is the same, Werner Blaser. Uh, look at these details. This is a table, reciprocal table, very nice joint. You see the grain of the timber, but also you see the quality of how these elements are combined together. Look at this one. Again, a very nice joint that takes advantage of not the frame construction. So really, this is how to cut and interlock natural timber, but in a reciprocal way. So this is a close-up of the detail. And uh, that one inspired another idea. Uh, reciprocal structures were born because we use 
structural beams, so we use elongated elements, linear elements. But look at this furniture. This furniture uh, inspired us because we see sheets, so we see surfaces. So what happens if we develop reciprocal structures out of surfaces? So we did a workshop at the Col de Ponte Chaussée in Paris, um, and we said, take these cardboards and start playing with them so that we make reciprocal structures out of planar panels and not beams to see what happens. And this is, for instance, an interesting example. So this is a fan made out of notches, four elements. So it's a four element uh, fan. Two of these are orthogonal. Also, these other two are orthogonal. And all of them together, they have an angle of 30 degrees. And this is the way it can grow in, on the plane, on the two dimensions. You can also develop it in the three dimensions, so in space. And that's a model that the students have made out of it. And even at the University of Melbourne, there was a studio a few years ago in which reciprocal structures have been used as thick beams to make joints and then develop this type of uh, very interesting cladding. Um, but that's it for now, so I'll meet you next week and we'll talk about steel.